So these are my disclosures for the abstract presentation. This is the four-year follow-up data on efficacy and safety from the Resonate trial. As we're all aware, brutinib is the first in class once daily oral inhibitor of BTK approved for the therapy of CLL in any line of therapy. And the phase three Resonate study at its first report demonstrated that abrutinib significantly improved both progression-free and overall survival compared to ofatumumab. And here we're presenting updated safety and efficacy results with four-year follow-up. This is the schema. Key eligibility includes CLL, SLL with at least one prior therapy, adequate performance status but not eligible for fludarabine-based therapy, and measurable nodal disease. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive oral abrutinib, 420 milligrams daily until progression, or IV ofatumumab at the relapsed labeled dose. Ultimately, 133 patients who progressed on ofatumumab received abrutinib in crossover. Baseline characteristics for each arm are shown here. The median age was 67 in both groups. Over half of the patients had advanced stage disease. Median number of prior therapies was three in the abrutinib arm and two in the ofatumumab arm. And you'll see that high-risk genomic abnormalities were common with deletion 11Q in a third of patients, deletion 17P in a third of patients. Fully half the patients on the abrutinib arm had a TP53 mutation, and about a quarter of the patients had complex karyotype. And so in terms of progression-free survival with a median follow-up on the abrutinib arm of 44 months, abrutinib led to an 87% reduction in the risk of progression or death, with a three-year progression-free survival of 59%, as compared to 3% for ofatumumab. In high-risk cytogenetic groups, the three-year progression-free survival was 53% for deletion 17P, so almost to a median, 66% for deletion 11Q and 58% for those with neither abnormality. And you'll note in the box how closely complex karyotype associates with high-risk cytogenetics. 42% of 17P patients carried it, 23% of 11Q patients, and only 15% of those with neither abnormality. In terms of IGHV mutation status, there's no difference in PFS with this degree of follow-up. In terms of P53 mutation status, which again, half the patients carried P53 mutation, there is a trend toward a worse PSF and PFS in those patients with P53 mutation. And as Dr. Kay mentioned earlier, we actually looked by individual P53 mutation versus 17P deletion versus both versus neither in the two-year follow-up paper and found that P53 with 17P, both abnormalities, did have worse PFS than neither. And so this may require further follow-up. As we do know, most 17P patients also have a P53 mutation, particularly in the relapse setting. And then as expected, those patients with more than two prior therapies had a worse PS PFS than those with less than or equal to two prior therapies. The benefit in PFS was seen across all baseline disease and patient characteristics, and a multivariate analysis demonstrated that more than two prior lines of therapy or an elevated beta-2 microglobulin were associated with decreased PFS with abrutinib. In terms of overall survival, early on there was an overall survival benefit for abrutinib, which as 133 patients crossed over to receive abrutinib, you can see narrows with time. But adjusting for crossover, you can see the ongoing overall survival benefit projected with abrutinib versus ofatumumab. In terms of response rates, you'll note that early on there's quite a significant rate of partial response with lymphocytosis, which diminishes dramatically, but still 5% of patients or so at three and four years do have ongoing lymphocytosis. And similarly, initially there's a very low rate of complete remission, which has risen steadily to 9% at this follow-up. And overall response is 91%. Median duration of treatments, 41 months, and 46% of patients continue on treatment. In terms of discontinuation, 27% discontinued for progression and 12% for adverse events. And of the 53 progressors, 14 of them had transformation as their primary reason for discontinuation. AEs leading to discontinuation included pneumonia, cytopenias, diarrhea. Most frequent cumulative AEs are similar to we've, what we've seen in most prior studies, including diarrhea, fatigue, and cough. 
in terms of grade three or higher AEs, about a quarter of patients had neutropenia. Pneumonia was seen in 17%. Hypertension, 8% at greater than grade three. 6% of patients had major hemorrhage, and all grade atrial fibrillation occurred in 11% of patients. Now, many of the grade three or higher AEs did decline over time during the study. You can see this is uh, quite evident for neutropenia as well as pneumonia and all infections declined from year one to subsequent years. Hypertension, in contrast, seems to be fairly steady over the later years. And atrial fibrillation, based on our four trial analysis, is highest in the first six months, but then continues at a low rate thereafter. So in conclusion, long-term results from Resonate demonstrate that abrutinib is tolerable and continues to show sustained efficacy in this study's previously treated and high genomically risk patients with CLL. The median PFS is not reached with up to four years of follow-up. Traditional poor prognostic factors, including unmutated IGHV and deletion 11Q, are not predictive of decreased PFS outcomes with abrutinib, at least with four-year follow-up. And again, with up to four years of follow-up, we're not seeing any long-term safety signals that we were not yet otherwise aware of. Thank you. <laughs>